I am Arzu Khosrowshahi. I'm a rheumatologist and associate professor of medicine at Emory University, Department of Medicine. I've been involved with IgG4 related disease since 2007 when I started my fellowship at Mass General Hospital and heard about the first uh, case of this condition. At that time, there was no name really calling this disease. There were more than dozens of name pointing to the same condition. And me and my mentor, Dr. John Stone, got interested about this condition and started studying the condition and patients that we were seeing. And before you know it, in 2012, we had the first symposium about this condition and got majority of the scientists and clinical researchers together and were able to come with a consensus for terminology and called the disease IgG4-related disease. IgG4-related disease is a fibroinflammatory condition. It's an immune-mediated process that causes mass-forming lesions in different organs of the body with frequent elevations of the serum IgG4. Wherever it affects, it has a unique histopathology, and that's how majority of the clinicians make the diagnosis after they try to understand what's happening. Is it a cancer or malignancy? Majority of the patients undergo surgery or biopsy, and the pathology of the condition actually is usually the key for making the diagnosis. In the past decade or more, we have understood a little bit more about the condition. So now measuring the serum IgG4, measuring other biomarkers in the blood can also help the clinicians to make the diagnosis. But really, like many other autoimmune diseases, it's really putting together the information from the history, physical exam, imaging, lab work and uh, pathology that helps the clinician to make the diagnosis. So there is no one test that you can do and say that these patients have IgG4D. So that has been the main challenge because not only these patients can come with different symptoms and signs based on what organ is affected with IgG4D, there is no specific test also to make the diagnosis. So one patient with IgG4D can have their orbit or the eye being affected go to ophthalmologists. The other one can have their pancreas, the same type of mass that in other patient was in their eyes happens in their pancreas, go to the gastroenterologist. Another one can have sinus problem, go to an ENT doctor. They have the same disease, but it's just manifesting in different organs. It's hard to put them together, multiple different subspecialties to understand what's going on and put the diagnosis. So the patient journey to get to the diagnosis usually involves multiple doctor's visits, multiple biopsies, multiple diagnosis of cancer, because usually the first thing is the doctor sees a mass and tell them, oh, we have to do the biopsy to make a diagnosis. But since the past 20 years, we have developed more knowledge in terms of like the patterns of organ involvement, some trends in the radiology, in the CT imaging, specific organs, the way that it looks like. So that can lead the radiologist to kind of like give a clue to the clinician. And if they check the serum IgG4 and it is elevated, that definitely ring a bell. Subspecialty send those patients to rheumatologists who usually deal with this kind of systemic multi-organ diseases and, and play the role of detective for diagnostic uh, of these complicated diseases. And what we have learned more is these mass lesions usually involve lots of lymphocytes and plasma cells, and that's why they expand. And that's why usually the patients become symptomatic because there is a lot of infiltration of lymphocytes and plasma cells into the tissue. So either causing mechanical pressure to the adjacent organs, like let's say if this mass is happening in the retroperitoneum of a patient, so it presses on the ureter and the patient comes with swollen legs or problem with their kidneys because it's mechanically closing down their ureters, obstructing the urine. In another patient, the infiltration of the plasma cells and B cells in their pancreas can affect the function of the pancreas. So both exocrine, which is the enzymes that helps us digest food, and the endocrine, which is the insulin, is affected. So patients comes with the symptoms related to those insufficiencies in the pancreas. So these are all related to that infiltration of the lymphocytes and plasma cells. So our job to 
help treat the patient is first to reduce that inflammation and that infiltration that is coming from the immune cells, mostly lymphocytes and plasma cells. Usually what happens is those plasma cells and lymphocytes, which some of them are B cells, produce a lot of IgG4. And that IgG4 also deposits in the organs. So we have to use medications to suppress the immune system that produces extra B cells and plasma cells produce IgG4. And the mainstay of the treatment so far has been glucocorticoids or steroid. Steroid melts away the disease. So clinicians have used it over time, especially in Asia, Japan, China, they use it all the time for this condition. It really works. It melts away the disease. Patients feel better. But we all know what steroids do to the body. So prolonged exposure to the steroid and back-to-back -back treatment with that causes a lot of side effects. IgG4-related disease, uh, like many other autoimmune diseases, is a, a condition that is characterized by its flares. So the patient receives a treatment, goes to remission, but then they flare. So what we know so far is symptomatically or based on their blood work, we see, oh, they, they have flared. But we haven't done enough studies to understand when the patient is not symptomatic, when the patient is not showing that their IgG4 is going up or their liver tests are going up, is there microinflammation and activity in multiple organs that is going on that we don't know? We don't we have no understanding of that. Unless we go and do biopsies of their tissues all the time, we are not going to be uh, completely aware if there is microinflammation or not. So the uh, approach of treating patients and then leaving them come back whenever they have a flare probably is not a good idea because it causes um, cumulative organ damage over time. And this is something that recently uh, some of the studies have shown that has been happening with um, this uh, uh, repeated glucocorticoid um, uh, tapering doses. So glucocorticoid has been the mainstay of the treatment because it melts away the disease. Some people even in the classification criteria, it's a criteria that we have put together to increase some specificity for the diagnosis of the condition, mainly for being able to enroll them for clinical research rather than diagnosing them. But one of the things that we use in that classification criteria is if the patient does not respond to a steroid treatment, they don't have IgG4 related disease because it is so responsive. Glucocorticoids have significant side effects, especially for these patients who are, we, we didn't talk about that, but they are usually middle-aged to older adults. They have their pancreas affected most of the time, which brings diabetes as a comorbidity. So putting those together main side effects of a glucocorticoid, which is diabetes, hypertension, osteoporosis, and cardiovascular disease is much higher in IgG4RD patients. So it's very important that we limit the exposure to glucocorticoids. And one of the main goals of this clinical trial, Mitigate, when the design was uh, happening, was to make sure that uh, we can get to the point that these patients would have glucocorticoid-free remission, which means that they come off the prednisone and do not need to go back on the prednisone for the flares that they have. The Mitigate clinical trial was designed. It's a placebo-controlled multinational study that was designed for studying uh, mainly to understand if these treatments would reduce the risk of IgG4D flare for these patients. So patients with diagnosis of IgG4-related disease who met the classification criteria, so for sure had the IgG4D diagnosis, were enrolled if they had history of more than two organ involvement. That reason was because those are patients who have higher risk for flaring and also had experienced an IgG4D flare in the past few weeks that required them to go on glucocorticoid for the treatment. So they were screened, they were continued on their glucocorticoid treatment for eight weeks during the study, but on day one, they received the enabilizumab or the placebo, which was repeated 15 days later for the second dose, and the patients were followed, and then again, they received another dose on week 26, and they were continued uh, on the treatment on the two-arm placebo and the drug. 
And what was seen actually was that 87% reduction in the risk of IgG4RD flare in the inibilizumab arm, which was very significant and really a milestone in disease and for these patients with IgG4-related disease, because that's an amazing reduction in flare that we don't usually see with autoimmune diseases. Then this medication was continued for open label treatment for three years for just kind of collecting the safety uh, information and also understanding the long-term efficacy of the drug. There were other outcome measures or um, endpoints in the study. The, the primary endpoint was that time to first flare that I just told you that was met with 87% reduction, but there were secondary endpoints, including the annualized flare rate, including number of patients who could achieve the steroid-free remission, and all of those secondary endpoints were also met. In addition to these endpoints that they met, inabilizumab showed reduction in the B cells of the patients that could be measured, which are the main player of the pathophysiology of the disease. And also their IgG4 in the serum dropped appropriately with the treatment. And they were all very interesting and exciting. So FDA approved for this condition, of course, like any other FDA approved medication, I'm sure the open label is going to continue. So we will learn more about the long-term safety of the medication in addition to long-term efficacy of the medication. But um, so far, it has been amazing. We have these uh, things that for FDA approved medication in rheumatology, we still learn a lot as we use them, because as I told you, this <clears throat> was a study for one year. Uh, so the question of how often, how long these patients need to, to receive this medication is still in the air. So definitely, uh, do we need to use it without glucocorticoids? Because I told you that patients received eight weeks of glucocorticoid. Many of my patients do not like to receive that. They would like to just get the drug without glucocorticoid. So those are all great questions that need to be answered with further study with this drug.